Hello and welcome. My name is Paulette Frank, and I have the privilege to serve as Johnson & Johnson's Chief Sustainability Officer. I'm excited to be back at Climate Week and to host today's session on climate change and health equity. Over the next hour, we will hear from healthcare professionals, climate experts, and local community leaders who are working to identify, support, and scale solutions to address the disproportionate impacts that climate change is having on the health and well-being of vulnerable populations. This is Johnson & Johnson's fourth time hosting a session at Climate Week. Each year, we have focused on a critical issue at the intersection of human and environmental health. From the role that women play in environmental health to the connection between forest health and the emergence of new infectious diseases. We do this to highlight the importance of these issues and to help change the course of climate change and the human health impacts that come with it. Climate Week is an important forum for businesses, governments, NGOs, and others to come together, to share ideas, to inspire each other, and to remember that we all have a role to play in addressing climate change and its impacts. Yet somehow, this year's event feels more significant than ever. Perhaps that's because the IPCC's sixth assessment report released last month provides the most comprehensive and concerning look at the impacts of human-induced climate change. As the report notes, recent changes in the climate are widespread, rapid, and intensifying, and impacts are affecting every region on Earth. Many of the changes we're seeing are unprecedented in centuries or even millennia. Or perhaps this year's Climate Week feels more urgent because many of us have now personally felt the impacts of climate change. I was in South Lake Tahoe visiting a friend last month. It was hazy and the air quality was not very good at the time, but we still enjoyed the natural beauty of the region. A few weeks later, my friend was evacuated because the fires were so close to her home. And in the Northeast where I live, my town was hit hard by the remnants, the remnants of Hurricane Ida with intense rainfall and flooding. I have colleagues in Europe and in Asia who have experienced the same earlier this year. While much progress has been made in the six years since the Paris Climate Agreement was signed, including through the leadership of many people who are watching today, it is clear that there is much more to do and that we need to get the job of curbing carbon emissions done faster by the middle of the century to avoid the most significant impacts of climate change on human and planetary health. Like many of you at Johnson & Johnson, we understand the scale of this challenge and we are committed to doing our part. Last year here at the Hub, I announced Johnson & Johnson's most ambitious climate goals to date. Aligned with the latest climate science, our goals will accelerate our transition to 100% renewable electricity and carbon neutrality in our operations while also reducing the emissions of our extended supply chain. We are wasting no time making progress because we know there's no time to waste. Today, over half of our global operations are powered with renewable electricity. And we recently finalized deals that will bring us to 100% renewable electricity for all operations in Europe and in North America in 2023. We've continued to decrease our carbon footprint year over year, achieving a 45% reduction since 2010. And we recently joined the Race to Zero with an ambition to reach net zero carbon emissions across our value chain by 2045. I am proud that Johnson & Johnson is among the many companies and organizations that are pushing towards a net zero future. But we can't ignore the impacts that climate change is having today. At Johnson & Johnson, our purpose is to profoundly change the trajectory of health for humanity. And we know that healthy people need a healthy planet. But as the science continues to show us, our planet today is not healthy higher temperatures, the increasing frequency and severity of extreme weather and natural disasters, rising sea levels, and other impacts are not only affecting our communities, 
they are affecting our health. Just this month, in an unprecedented statement, editors of 220 leading medical and public health journals called for urgent action on climate change. As the Chief Sustainability Officer of the world's largest and most broadly based healthcare company, I believe as a healthcare community, we have a unique opportunity and a unique responsibility to do more, to look beyond our own operations and value chains, to drive positive change on issues that affect the health of the people we serve, issues like a healthy climate. Today, climate change is a global public health threat. But as urgent as this situation is, it is even more acute for the most vulnerable among us. That's because the reality is that while many of us may experience the impacts of climate change, the impacts on human health are not experienced or distributed equally. Vulnerable populations around the world, children, older populations, ethnic minorities, poorer communities, and those with underlying health conditions are the ones that are affected the most, in part because of where they live and in part because they lack the means to mitigate the impacts that are coming. In the last months, UNICEF has reported that approximately 1 billion children are at an extremely high risk of the impacts of the climate crisis. According to The Lancet, in the last 20 years, there's been a 50% increase in heat-related deaths among people older than 65. And a recent study by the Environmental Protection Agency notes that in the US, the most severe harms from climate change fall disproportionately upon underserved communities who are least able to prepare for and recover from heat waves, poor air quality, flooding, and other impacts. Gandhi once said, the true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members. So as we meet throughout the week to discuss our shared role in combating the worst effects of climate change, let's keep in mind the people who aren't here with us. Those most vulnerable who are counting on us to be their voices this week and beyond. That is why today's session is focused on climate change and health equity. At Johnson & Johnson, we are working with like-minded partners to support research, education, and actions to mitigate the impacts that vulnerable communities are feeling today and to enable the much needed interventions for longer term resiliency. I am proud to once again use this forum, Climate Week, to hear from leaders who will help us better understand the seriousness of this issue and inspire us with the work they are doing to address it. We will begin with a discussion with Dr. Cheryl Holder, who will help us understand how climate change is already affecting the most vulnerable and also talk about the important role that the medical community can play. From there, we will hear about a unique fellowship program that Johnson & Johnson is supporting for physicians of color who are advancing solutions for at-risk patients in their communities. And we will close with a panel discussion with local NGO and policy leaders who are working to strengthen both adaptation and resilience measures for people in their regions. Thank you all for being with us today. And now it is my privilege to introduce our first guest. Dr. Cheryl Holder is a fellow in the American College of Physicians. She has dedicated her medical career to caring for low wealth populations. Throughout her distinguished career, she has served as a National Health Service Corps Scholar and as Medical Director of Jackson Memorial Hospital's North Dade Health Center. Today, as faculty at Herbert Wertheim College of Medicine at Florida International University, she focuses on teaching the impact of social determinants of health, addressing diversity in health professions, and increasing awareness of HIV prevention and the health impact of climate change. Welcome, Dr. Holder, and thank you so much for being here today. The accomplishments well, that I just you. mentioned are only a sample from your extensive career, which has focused on addressing disparities in healthcare. What first drew you to this space? Well, thank you for having me. 
And that question, what drew me to this space, I guess goes back to a lot of doctors. Uh, I review a lot of applications to medical school. And over the years, there's a common thread of things that happen in our childhood that impacts us and imprints something. And many times we don't fully get to it till later in life where we kind of reflect back. And I, around age 10, had a huge change in my life where I left my country of Jamaica um, on just knowing what I knew of playing and hanging out with friends and family and brought to East New York, Brooklyn. And that time in East New York, Brooklyn in the 60s, it was a very volatile time in New York City. And we were in a community that, you know, I didn't know back then, but it was really uh, what they used to call a slum, a ghetto, a poor area. This is what my family could afford. And knowing some of the problems in the community, my mother just have a sit on the stoop and not really play with all the kids. And in particular, one day this episode comes to mind where, where most of the kids played in the streets. And some of the fun things to do was hitching a ride on the back of the bus with their roller skates and coming on down. And that was really what we had. I wasn't allowed, so I would just watch. And one day this little girl fell off the back and hit her head and laid in the street. And we all waited for ambulance to come and we were waiting. And you just heard the chatter in the neighborhoods, just really concerned that no ambulance came. And then I go to other aspects of my life where I work in other communities. And in so many ways, there was nothing that came to help this population. And with that, I evolved and started doing this medicine where I went back to my community and one of the important things I understood and I wanted to do was change that paradigm, change that so there is some help that could come early enough to prepare and to recognize why did we all have to play in the streets? What was that the only fun thing that kids had to do? And what can we do in our communities and improving the health? So that's imprinted and grew in so many other experiences that allowed me to do this kind of medicine. Incredibly rewarding. And I've just been fortunate to meet patients that have driven me to keep going over 30 plus years. I can see why your work really comes from your heart. So today's session, Dr. Holder, is about climate change and health equity. What does health equity mean to you? Uh, health equity. You know, I hear it all the time and most folks don't quite get what we're referring to, but the full definition that I see it is that everyone has an equal and fair opportunity to have the best health of all, equal and fair opportunities. So when we look at equity, you have to then say, what does that person need? And how do I address their needs so they can have that equal opportunity to have that health outcomes. So when I look at our society, you can't just say, what did the need? You also have to say, how did we arrive at this situation? That there's some people who are doing worse than others. And some folks have certain challenges, have some certain barriers. And when we look at access to health insurance, all the resources that different communities have, we start having to think, where did this all come from? We can't be ahistorical because if we're going to find what people need to improve their health outcome, then we will have to have an, what we say, equitable response, giving them what they need to get that equal access to a fair, justice, really the right type of health care, the right type of services, the right type of community. I use um, in climate change, this is what we are talking about. When we look at trees, everyone you hear, let's plant more trees, let's plant more trees. And an equal response would be, yes, let's just plant trees all over our communities. But when you look at what communities in some cities are 10 degrees hotter than other communities, and those people living in those communities have more health problems because of heat, then we say, maybe we don't want equal trees everywhere. We've got to look at 
get trees to these communities. After we get trees to these communities, how do we train our community members to understand what happened to them? How do we train them to maintain the trees? How do we get jobs around in keeping those trees and keeping that community healthy? Now that's an equitable response. And so that's what we look forward to across the board in terms of health equity. And it's there's so many other ways that we look at equity. Um, I don't know if I have more time to tell you that in my personal experience, and everyone has personal experiences about equity. And I tell my family, my mom loved to dress all three girls in the family the same. My sister is eight years older than me. The other one is five years older and I'm the youngest. And I have a picture in my fa in the book and I am beaming, smiling from ear to ear. The eyes are big and really happy. And we're all in the same outfit, the same hairstyle. And I look over at my sister in the pictures, not so much smiles. And so I'm wondering, and you think equal, but did they have the same access to that joy and that glee that I felt and that happiness? Not so much. Equal response is not really what we need to improve health. We need equitable responses. That's a very vivid example. Thank you for sharing that. So the human health impacts of climate change are becoming clearer and clearer. Can you share a little bit about what those human health impacts are? Uh, you know, climate impacts us in so many ways, really. But if you think about it, there are four big ways. Uh, we've all been experiencing these changes. So luckily, we're not where we were 15, 20 years ago, where I had to fight and tell folks that climate change is happening. But think about one of the big areas, mental health, our emotional well-being. I think of those just recently in New York. You guys experienced this tremendous downpour and the water was pouring into the subway system in this, um, just, I saw a picture. And I can only imagine the terror those people felt when they were going home from work at 1 a.m. in the morning, unprepared, unbeknownst, with this huge deluge of water. That's trauma. Just preparing for the extreme weather events, just surviving the extreme weather events, just surviving the heat, just being hot alone, changes your mood. We've seen learning change. So your emotional well-being is tremendously impacted by climate. I think of all the migration issues, the wildfires, even if we're not even personally in it, we feel it. So you're having the mental emotional effects. You're having direct effects, just the heat. We know heat changes physiologically. It increases your heart rate, increases your blood pressure, your sweating mechanism changes. It causes dehydration. It causes kidney disease, triggering heart disease, so many problems that come from heat. So we have its direct effects. Then the effects on the rest of the planet. So you're going to have disruption of your food supplies. So it's not simply that you're hot, not simply that the weather, but all the planetary elements, the food, the insects, the diversity, all gets changed and will disrupt our access to water, access to healthy foods and are changing in way food will be distributed. So we're looking at the dis destruction of our access to food and water. And then inf insects and infections, what we call vector-borne diseases. Think about it as the temperature rises, things that didn't live in areas like mosquitoes are now moving higher, different parasites are changing, the trees are getting infected with different infections that didn't happen before. So we're seeing Zika, Dengue. Here in Florida, we had Dengue, we've had Zika. Even when we consider what's happening in zoonotic spread, even the things that are concerning with coronavirus as the permafrost, and as we move closer to more and more of these viruses and these animals, it is driving our infection. So we have the direct effect, the waterborne, the food disruption, the vector-borne disease and our emotional well-being. Lots of health problems that come from that. And especially for younger children who do not have the mechanism developed physiologically to be able to address these needs. So when you think of these direct effects, I use a mnemonic 
Um, and we teach this with our medical students, we teach it all over. So it's easy to remember, it's called heat wave. Eight really major ways in which you will see heat and what climate does. And we talk about heat illness, the exacerbation of heart and lung disease, asthma worsening, traumatic injuries, especially after extreme weather. And we've seen it with the electric, when you get electrocuted or people fall as they're repairing their rooms and repairing their houses, lots of traumatic injuries, water and foodborne illnesses, allergies, as the trees are growing rapidly and we're getting higher flowering earlier, the allergy season is extending and we're seeing worsening allergies. Again, we talked about the vector borne diseases spreading all over the world and emotional stress. We cannot deny that the stress involved in heat, the stress involved in preparing for all these extreme weather events, the stress involved in just facing that if we don't do something about this climate early, what could happen to our children and grandchildren. So the tremendous impact on our health, it's real, it's happening now, and of course it's happening to those who are most vulnerable. And in our world right now, it's primarily black and brown people that are feeling this impact on our health because of our climate. Dr. Holder, in, in the last couple of minutes that we have together, can you share a little bit about how you're seeing these human health impacts manifest themselves in your patients and also some of the work that you're doing to intervene? Yeah, you know, I always talk about my first patient that opened my eyes and pushed me on to say, I have to do something more. Again, you heard from over the years, all the work I've done. And this one patient came in with anime. She couldn't pay her light bill. She didn't realize that the heat was causing her to why she had to run this AC day and night because she had her lung problems, she couldn't breathe. And that would worsen every time it got hot in the daytime and at night because we don't cool as much as night when we have all this climate change and all the heat. And that triggered her asthma. She used her inhalers too much. She couldn't pay her light bill and she came in to me for help. I had to see what I could do, but at this point, there isn't as much as we have prepared our communities to address this issue of heat and how to protect people like Miss Anime. Then I have my outdoor workers. And my outdoor worker, he, you know, he tells me, day or night, rain or shine, I have to work. He was undocumented, he had to work. So when it was 100 degrees outside and with a heat index even more, he would take his little shade, but he would go right back out and that would cause his dehydration. And he couldn't rest long enough, so then his kidneys would get worse. And as we try and prepare our populations, these stories continue on and on. Um, one of my patients who came from Guatemala, and what happened in Guatemala is that the coffee crops and the farming is done because of the drought and the changes in our climate, and they migrate into our communities. And he came at only 15, 16, having to work as an adult because of that change. And there's so many more, especially with the elevation and sea level rise, displacing poor people, the what you just, every day there's an impact somewhere because I'm here in Miami and I feel it. And there are things we're doing and there are things that doctors can do, nurses, everyone can do. We can help prepare our patients for this. We can get involved. There are lots of organizations. I help form the Florida Clinicians for Climate Action. And there we look at educating, edu ed engaging the clinicians and advocating for climate. Because this is now, it's not 20 years from now, it's not 10 years from now, it's right now. And if we're not getting our patients involved, where we have to do the research, we have to change our curriculum, we have to alert the politicians, we have to alert everyone on the day-to-day -day impact that this is happening, and especially for the future. So um, clinicians, nurses, doctors, most trusted messengers, just like we're seeing now in coronavirus, there is a role that we have, an important role, because we see so much of this world population at some point, and how do we integrate it in every health decision we make because the climate impacts us on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you for that, Dr. Holder. I would love to hear from you what you're hopeful about for the future. 
I am really hopeful that I know we're going to get beyond this. Like I said, history tells us everything. And we have conquered so many changes in our world from HIV, AIDS, the coronavirus, a vaccine in one year. We know we're going to get beyond this. So I am always filled with hope and I know we're going to be successful. It's just how do we get everyone the opportunity to be have that fair, equal access to that health outcomes? How do we get our vulnerable populations to make it through to the end that we know will happen? Dr. Holder, thank you so, so much for being with us today. You are on the front lines and such an inspiration to all of us um, within the medical community and those of us who support the medical community. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Time goes so quickly, but we can make a difference and there is time and we will make a difference. Yes, we will. It's inspiring to hear about the positive impact that a physician like Dr. Holder is making within her own community and beyond. At Johnson & Johnson, we recognize the important role that healthcare professionals can play in raising awareness and driving solutions related to climate change and health equity. For several years, Johnson & Johnson has partnered with the Medical Society Consortium for Climate and Health to help raise awareness across professional medical communities on how climate change impacts specific patient populations. This includes identifying physicians who are interested in the intersection of climate and health and empowering them to be advocates for their patients and their communities. Last year, we expanded this partnership to include the National Medical Association, the largest and oldest national organization representing the interests of African-American physicians and their patients. Together with the Medical Society Consortium for Climate and Health and the National Medical Association, we created the first fellowship for physicians of color focused on climate and health equity. This is the first class of climate and health equity fellows. These physicians are breaking new ground on the role of medical professionals in caring for our planet. They are working on a range of projects that include advocating for climate friendly policies, educating and informing their peers within their profession, working with patients who are at most at risk of climate related health impacts and driving sustainability initiatives within medical systems. I am happy to have the chance to share more on this work and to showcase the voices of some of the Climate and Health Equity Fellows. The science is clear. Climate change is a public health crisis that disproportionately impacts vulnerable communities. Johnson & Johnson's purpose is to profoundly change the trajectory of health for humanity. And as the world's largest healthcare company, we know that healthy people need a healthy planet. So we are using our expertise, our resources, and our convening power to support the frontline leaders of today and help create the change agents of tomorrow. Together, we are working to identify and advance solutions at the intersection of climate change and health equity that matter to our company, our communities, and our planet. I was on a mission trip with doctors in Haiti after the earthquake in 2010. The level of devastation due to neglected infrastructure felt unreal. The incredible amount of damage and death throughout the country made disaster relief efforts really difficult. Response times were slow and the needs of the most vulnerable were at times overwhelming and often went unmet. At the time, these challenges felt specific to Haiti. 
But then I started making connections to what I was seeing in my own community. When a hurricane brushed past Miami, I saw the same lack of infrastructure and slow response to vulnerable populations occurring right in front of my face. It reminded me of the same scenario I witnessed in Haiti. It was hard not to be affected. Poor, working class, black and brown people are at disproportionate risk during natural disasters because the systems and infrastructure are not always in place to support them. I started a program to help respond to these needs before, during, and after disasters occur. As part of the Climate and Health Equity Fellowship, I am operationalizing this work so we can reach similar populations across the country. What's promising is that I'm seeing more young people connecting climate change to health equity and social justice and joining the fight for a more equitable seat at the table in policy and in infrastructure. And as more young people begin to recognize this connection, we can accelerate the push for environmental justice for everyone. As a family physician, I started to notice some changes in medical practice. Seasonal allergies lasting longer and respiratory issues like asthma and COPD getting worse. And living in the South, I also started to see an increase in heat-related illnesses because of the extreme weather patterns. More kids missing school and adults starting to miss work. But none of this was surprising. The Gulf Coast region is increasingly vulnerable to the inequities caused by the climate crisis. Air pollution natural disasters, water contamination, have had devastating effects on communities of color, the poor, and those with pre-existing conditions. Climate change is a public health emergency, and we need to treat it like one. Through the Climate and Health Equity Fellowship, I am working to educate healthcare professionals and the public about health benefits of energy efficiency and renewable energy. I want people to understand why it's important to move away from fossil fuels, why they should care about clean energy, and how these shifts will positively impact their lives and the lives of their loved ones. I want to see our Southern communities use this information to mobilize and demand policy change to support a cleaner future. Because you see, there is no turning back, and no one can be left behind. The first time that I made the connection between health equity and environmental impacts like climate change was in medical school. We were shown a graph of the prevalence of asthma as a function of zip code. The gist of the analysis was that you could predict the likelihood of someone having asthma based solely on where they lived. Digging deeper, I began to learn more about the uneven distribution of environmental waste in communities of color and how it impacts everything from air quality to natural disasters and, of course, health outcomes. This recognition sparked my earliest interest in the problem. It influenced the way that I live my life and the focus of my work. The Climate and Health Equity Fellowship is an incredible opportunity to learn about the intricacies of climate change and healthcare. It provides an opportunity for me to use my unique voice as a physician to drive change in my community and beyond. Through the fellowship, I am engaging with like-minded leaders and educators to create sustainability infrastructure and reduce waste within my hospital system. To elevate the connection between climate change and healthcare access within medical communities, and to advocate for policy change, there is so much the general public can do to help us in this fight against environmental justice. First, educate yourself on the issues related to climate change, how they affect your community and the country at large. And second, get involved with local initiatives that help the climate change awareness and reform. There are so many organizations doing great work, and they could really use the support to expand their initiatives. Now, I am pleased to introduce my colleague, Sonali Sharma, who will lead our next discussion. Thank you, Paulette. We just heard from the front lines of healthcare and about the need for more community level action and leadership. 
For our next segment, I'm delighted to be joined by two amazing individuals who are working on the front lines of community engagement and policy change. Without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce Deanna Moran and Irene Berger. Deanna is the Director of Environmental Planning for the Conservation Law Foundation and an organization that has dedicated itself to creating long-term solutions to environmental challenges. In her role, Deanna is responsible for identifying and implementing cutting edge solutions to a variety of environmental issues that lie at the intersection of planning, development and regulation. In particular, she oversees climate resiliency activities for Southern New England. Irene is the C40 Air Quality Advisor for the Los Angeles Mayor's Office, where she develops and delivers policies and projects to achieve citywide air quality and health impacts. In her role, she leads and oversees the city's contribution to the South Coast Air Quality Management Plan and works on implementing solutions at the nexus of environment and human health. Welcome, Deanna and Irene. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, Irene, I wanted to start with a question for you. Over the last five years, our team at Johnson & Johnson has partnered with the C40 Cities Leadership Group to enable 30 cities to take actions at this nexus of climate, air quality, and health, one of which is Los Angeles. As lead C40 city, you've been looking at the co-benefits of climate and health to drive local policy change. And I wanted you to share with us how the findings from this work integrated into LA's Green New Deal sustainability plan. Yeah, thanks, Sonali. Um, yeah, I would say um, that, you know, having been a part of the demonstrator city cohort for C40 um, has been really critical to bringing in the resources and also kind of new knowledge and expertise around um, focusing more on the health impacts of air quality, which, you know, prior to Johnson & Johnson's sponsorship of um, the, the C40 demonstrator cities in LA is kind of like a case study of this, um, there wasn't any focus on air quality or health on the sustainability team for the mayor. Um, and just to and just to specify too, I'm with the mayor's office, the so Mayor Garcetti's office, um, and we don't have a human health or public health department in the city of Los Angeles. We have a county one, and then we have regional and state um, air quality, uh, you know, agencies. But so to bring in those kinds of resources within the mayor's office in the city of LA was really critical to kind of kickstart some of this work, which before we just relied on. Um, our partnerships with regional and state agencies. Um, so just just to underscore, I think it went a long way. Um, what we ended up doing when we launched our Green New Deal, LA's Green New Deal in 2019, which was an, our updated sustainability plan for the mayor, and it covered um, a very comprehensive, big focus on equity and environmental justice, but it covered um, many aspects of air quality. And so what we were able to do with um, the Johnson & Johnson sponsorship was um, really be able to map out and establish um, health benefits analysis for some of our key targets of our Green New Deal, including 100% zero emission vehicles, 100% building electrification, and reducing um, industrial emissions by 80% by 2050. And we found that those actions alone will um, reduce mortality by close to 2,000 people per year, um, will avoid significant um, amounts of respiratory cardiovascular disease also in the city, and will save billions of dollars. And that's another thing um, that we don't think of the money saved from you know taking care of our health better and from improving air quality and the tie there. So um, I think that work was really critical. And just to give you a quick example of um, how that type of health benefits analysis had an impact on our work, um, you know, we were able to make the case for more ambitious policy in the city of Los Angeles. Um, you know, sometimes reducing talking points around around reducing carbon emissions and avoiding climate change only go so far for for some groups and some people. But um, it's much more real and tangible to talk about health. It's something that we all experience, that we all care about. And so to actually talk in terms of avoid mortality and morbidity, especially in our most burdened and polluted and contaminated neighborhoods in Los Angeles, um, helped with socializing the plan 
um, within our city departments, pushing them to take more ambitious action because ultimately they're the implementers. Um, and it, it also inspired action um, in some new policies, for example, our LA 100 study, which is um, a study that our municipal utility, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, undertook over, over four years to look at how to get Los Angeles to run on 100% renewable energy. And uh, we just concluded that study. And over the last year of that study, they did, con they did carry out health benefits analysis as well. Um, and partially that was inspired by our Green New Deal work. And they saw the impact that that made in terms of making the case for our ambitious programs. And it was also that something that the community um, demanded after that. So um, that's just an example of, of, you know, the great work that we were able to do because of that sponsorship. Thank you. And what a, what a fascinating way to bring the co-benefits of climate and health. And you also mentioned economic benefits into the same lens. I was curious, what was really the impetus to really then integrate the equity lens, the environmental justice lens to this work? I'll just zoom out for a second here because um, the environmental justice movement in California has, you know, a long history, a very, very long history, starting with um, just really kind of a legacy of um, environmental racism, underrepresentation, and um, eventually what what's happened in California, and we've really seen um, the grassroots movement happening at the ground level from EJ organizations over decades of work um, has led to, you know, real impact within agencies and within cities um, to, to pay attention to environmental justice and to prioritize environmental justice. And so before we as a city started integrating in our own plans, um, there, there's just, there was a grand, ground, groundswell of movement um, towards more of that integration. We've seen at the state level, environmental justice advisory committees crop up in the, you know, California Public Utilities Commission and the California Air Resources Board um, in the state legislature. And we've seen the development of, you know, EJ tools like Cal Screen that helps designate um, overburdened communities in the state of California. Through, a, through 20 different indicators, including air pollution, but also poverty, education level, um, things like that. So there's been a movement towards that and um, it's undeniable now you can't, you really can't make good policy without truly taking an equity lens to everything that you're doing. And so, and you know, Mayor Garcetti is very passionate about this topic. Um, he's been a big champion and advocate of environmental justice since he was council president, you know, decades ago. And so he, um, it was really, really imperative for him. And even in his first um, sustainability plan, it, the focus was environment, equity, and economy. And so he's always recognized the importance, but this iteration of the sustainability plan in 2019, the Green New Deal, we really took it to a new level. We integrated environmental justice throughout all 13 chapters, and we also, designated its own um, chapter. And now an implementation of it, um, we've created a variety of different programs, including um, an initiative that we had originally in our Green New Deal that we just launched, which is the Climate Emergency Mobilization Office. Um, we, along with some council members and really the community, a coalition called the LEAP Coalition comprised of some really active environmental justice community members and organizations, um, together advocated for um, millions of dollars in the budget and the city budget to be allocated towards the creation of this office. And what the Climate Emergency Mobilization Office does is um, it brings in a participatory um, model of governance into the city by creating something called community assemblies, which are basically assemblings out in different neighborhoods and they're listening sessions, but also feedback sessions and the creation of a climate emergency commission comprised of um, environmental, uh, you know, community-based organizations, environmental groups, climate and EJ experts, labor experts, unions, um, indigenous voices, and small business voices, as well as some general managers from key departments, city departments. And what's gonna happen is through that community assembly, um, community level feedback and the commission, 
um, after the first year, our climate emergency mobilization director will come up with a strategic plan that um, really kind of integrates these voices and those priorities into what the city is doing. So that's just an example of how really environmental justice has seeped into everything that we do and is just really a priority and is, is we're making a big effort to try to integrate it into what we're doing in the city. Thank you, Irene. Um, Deanna, I wanted to um, actually talk about Conservation Law Foundation's efforts. You know, your organization has been fighting for a healthy climate and, and you know, resilient communities across New England for, for uh, many decades now, including helping designing the country's first cap and trade program to, to making the case for new clean energy projects. Can you tell us about the shifts um, your organization has made in recent years to focus more on this intersection of climate, health, and community resilience, especially in vulnerable communities. Yeah, thank you, Sonali. Um, so, you know, CLF historically as an organization has kind of very been, been, been very focused on law. Um, we were primarily, you know, a staff of attorneys, as you mentioned. We worked on large scale systems change, cap and trade, shutting down coal plants, um, even up, even cleaning up the Boston Harbor. And increasingly over time, I think we've seen the impact that place-based work can have in the suite of different approaches and skills that are really needed to make meaningful long-term change. So we're absolutely still you know, doing that large-scale systems change work, but we're also being really intentional and strategic about how we work in and with communities. Um, you know, we've diversified our strategies for addressing big environmental problems, you know, not just relying on the law, but also on science, planning, the market, um, you know, like most environmental groups, we are extremely focused on climate change, but I think we're unique in that we recognized pretty early on, probably before a lot of other mainstream environmental groups got on board, um, this critical nexus between climate health and equity um, and the disparate impacts that long-standing environmental challenges and burdens have had on marginalized and frontline communities that are now being exacerbated by climate impacts. Um, and just, you know, one example of how we've really, you know, tried to change the game in terms of our approach is supplementing our traditional advocacy with social impact investing, recognizing that, you know, health, economy, um, environment, they're all tied together in a way that we really, we can't really disentangle them. And we recognized um, several years ago now the opportunity and the need for a market strategy in this space. So, you know, our Healthy Neighborhood Equity Fund focuses on bringing new sources of capital to mixed use, mixed income, real estate projects that, you know, we believe can catalyze the creation of healthier, more environmentally sustainable neighborhoods. Um, and we achieve that, you know, in part through a health scorecard that we've created, you know, our potential, potential investments have to complete and meet a number of metrics for sustainability, health, resilience, in order to qualify for those funds. Um, but we prioritize projects that are sustainably built, that are near transit, that are in the communities that we want to prioritize because of um, the marginalization that they've experienced and that incorporate energy efficiency, resilience, all of the things that we think will help promote um, healthy living in a healthy environment. More recently, we've piloted um, a healthy retail and commerce fund that combines investments from hospitals, health systems, foundations, to support businesses that will create jobs, improve food access, affordability, and econ economic development in communities. And I think having the buy-in from health systems and hospitals has been really essential too. I think we're starting to see a real shift where um, you know the, you, people are starting to understand you really can't disentangle health from environment. Um, and there are so many um, factors that are playing into the health outcomes that we're seeing, um, not only in you know across the country, but particularly in um, some of these marginalized and frontline communities. That's great. And I'm so glad that you were able to make the case for change because you're absolutely right. The trifecta of these issues are, are so interconnected. Now, your organization was also one of the grantees of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Cities Taking Action to Address Health Quality and Climate Change Initiative. Tell us more about that program and you know, what are your desired outcomes? Um, what communities are you working in and your vision therein? Yeah, uh, we're so grateful to be um, a grantee for Robert Wood Johnson. Our grant's part of the Global Ideas for U.S. Solutions portfolio. And so we've been inspired by a number of models from across the world, um, including Paris, London, Bologna, Fortaleza. Um, and we really developed a blended approach to address issues specifically at the intersection of mobility and extreme heat. Um, and I'll take a step back because I think some context here is important. You know, we chose Lawrence, Massachusetts 
as a city for this project because it really, to us, embodied everything that we're trying to tackle at this intersection of climate, health, and equity. Um, and for anyone who's not familiar with Lawrence, Massachusetts, it's you know really a textbook environmental justice community. It was created as a planned industrial community um, in the late 19th century, became kind of a world-renowned location for um, textile and paper production. But like many other communities um, similarly situated at that time, it really had to kind of shift and change in the 1950s with deindustrialization. Um, and they experienced you know, a, huge wage of, a huge wave of immigration, um, primarily from Puerto Rico. And today they remain a gateway community and they're, you know, it's home to immigrants, mostly from the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico and Central America, um, who make up over 80 percent of its population. Um, like I said, you know, the majority of residents are people of color. Um, over 40 percent are foreign born. English is a second language for the majority of households. Um, and Lawrence, you know, unfortunately, has a really high unemployment rate. Um, a lot of residents living below the poverty line. Um, uh, the, how, the median household income is less than half of the state average. Um, and at the same time, you know, Lawrence, especially given its industrial history, is home to um, a very high concentration of current and former brownfield sites. Um, so a lot of contamination um, it at the same time has kind of the second lowest amount of green space per capita in our state. Um, simultaneously as the fourth highest de population density. So all of these things kind of come together um, to create the, the dynamics that we have in Lawrence, which are a lot of disproportionate health impacts. Um, environmental health issues in Lawrence, you know, range from having the highest rate of hospitalization for respiratory illness in the state to the second highest rate of childhood asthma, elevated levels of pretty much everything, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, COPD, Alzheimer's, diabetes. Um, so, you know, you name it. And um, Lawrence, you know, we felt like this was a really uh, a place that we could really make a meaningful impact and difference. And the approach that we're taking is to work alongside residents and understand um, what the barriers in the community are to more active, healthy um, mob mobility, recreation. We're trying to identify throughout the, the city um, a vision for a resilient corridor system. So what are those places that are most traveled, most important to get people from um, their home to their job, the, the kind of important places and resources that they need to access, and how do we create active corridors? How do we make it um, safer and more comfortable for people to walk and bike or take public transportation, um, try and decrease the congestion that we're seeing? There's a lot of traffic congestion and pollution in Lawrence, um, monitoring the air quality through air quality sensors, and then kind of tying all of that together um, with some, with some um, strategies to leverage the natural systems in Lawrence to address one of the things that residents are most um, or increasingly concerned about, which is extreme heat, climate-induced extreme heat. Thank you, Diana. I mean, congratulations on the grant and, and can't wait for um, that work to come to life. Now, you're both driving change at the front lines in your communities. Um, and given many environmental justice efforts are being led by local groups um, and at the grassroots level, like you mentioned, um, I wanted to hear from both of you on what are some of the barriers and opportunities you face from each of your perspectives? Irene, if you could start with you. Yeah, sure. I'd say um, a barrier with the environmental justice community is um, building trust with local stakeholders. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there you know we have a legacy of environmental racism and just blatant racism in California and in Los Angeles. And um, so there's there's a lot of mistrust in government and rightfully so. So um, a big part of, you know, I think what we need to do as a city and just government officials in general need to take a lot of accountability and really put their money where their mouth is, including us, and um, allocate money from our budget towards policies that are really um, you know, going towards vulnerable communities and that are responding to the direct concerns that we hear from vulnerable communities. And so um, there's no one size fits all. Every community is different. And that's why it's important to um, really be able to go out and listen to what those uh, concerns are and to understand what those are um, and then to actually act on them. And so an example of that is in our city budget, we've allocated, you know, three and a half million dollars towards um, oil remediation and really looking at phase out of oil drilling in the city of Los Angeles. Los Angeles has the largest urban oil drilling in, in the country and we have thousands of oil wells next to 
communities, in within communities, next to schools, next to um, senior centers, next to areas where vulnerable uh, populations that are more prone to health impacts from poor air quality that they've been breathing in their whole lives live. And so, um, you know, we have had very active stakeholders, including a coalition called Stand LA, um, advocating for the phase out of oil drilling for a very, very long time now. And it's something that the city is seriously looking at now. Um, we are carrying out a, something called an amortization study, which is basically just looking at the legal feasibility of phasing out oil drilling um, through changes in our zoning code and designation of oil fields. Um, and we're really inspired by cities like Culver City that have really taken the lead on that. Um, but that just is one example, I think, where um, we're trying to reverse a real legacy of, of, of environmental injustice in the, in the city. And um, I think policies like that hopefully will do a, something around building trust with the community, but also just righting the wrongs of, of the past. Thank you, Irene and, and Deanna. Yeah, I'll just echo everything that Irene said. I think that that um, also is the dynamic that we're seeing play out in Massachusetts and elsewhere in the country. Um, I, I really want to focus on the opportunity that we see. I think in our project in Lawrence, we've learned a lot and our approach there, um, you know, so far has seemed to be really effective. You know, we knew going in that as a, as a kind of an outsider, a statewide organization, we wouldn't be able to effectively facilitate this project alone. And so it was important to us going in that we identified a strong um, community partner. And um, we were lucky that we had a longstanding relationship with Groundwork Lawrence, who's our community partner in this project. And Groundwork Lawrence has had, you know, decades and decades of relationships and trust built in the city of Lawrence. Um, and that's been absolutely critical for this project. Um, at the same time, we never saw groundwork as kind of a stand-in for resident participation. We knew that there needed to be a really robust community engagement process as well, and that although groundwork was really going to spearhead and help us lead that community engagement process, um, we wanted to have input from actual residents. So from the beginning, we built into our budget money to pay residents to be part of a resident task force that would work with us throughout the 30-month grant period, um, helping us to refine the scope of the project, drive the vision for the project, and we're really um, lucky that we have an enthusiastic, bought in, really great task force that we're working with. And they've already started to kind of reshape and drive the project in the direction that they feel makes the most sense for their city and for the residents. Um, and so in, in, in saying this, I think a lot of people wonder, well, you know, what is the role for a group like CLF if, if this really needs to be led from the ground up? And I think that strength that CLF brings to this partnership is, um, you know, we have that statewide and in some cases regional lens of what's happening elsewhere. And we're able to really um, bring a level of technical expertise and assistance to the project that we can help facilitate um, the community partners, the city, the city partners, the, the residents um, and bring this and, and scale it up. Um, I think that this really could be a model that's exportable, um, not only in our region, but elsewhere. Thank you both so much. This has been an incredible discussion and you've certainly given us all a lot to think about at this nexus of climate um, and health equity. Um, and to all our viewers, thank you for being here. We're just so proud to be part of this year's Climate Week and use this important platform to hear some uh, about some of the local ground roots uh, work and changes each of our frontline um, workforce and communities driving. I hope each and every one of you can take at least one idea, one action at this intersection that you can influence and drive forward. Um, take care.